We're very happy, well, we've got a lot of people with some rural experience. I'm very happy that Malcolm is going to just make a couple of points. We'll also address these in the panel because I know Penny, Penny and others are working in, in this area too. But I've just asked Malcolm to say a few words. Then we'll go into, I know everyone's getting either hungry, late or tired. Okay, uh, stand, stand no, well, well we might, uh, we, we could do that. Uh, and then we'll go into, so if you do want to stand up for a sec, please do. And then we'll go into a little panel and we'll just see how long and if we break up, I mean, people can, don't feel like, we won't be offended if you if you uh, wander off because you've got other commitments and I know there's big commutes. But, uh, so I've just asked Malcolm to say a few things yep. and then we'll go into a little bit of panel. So my interest in this comes from one, I was born in a rural area, but then I also do both some consultancy work at Ballarat Hospital and I run a telehealth service with Mildura, Horsham and Hamilton. Um, and so there's quite a bit out there and I just want to pick out some key points. Uh, this, the pain cohort in the rural area is higher proportion of men. They're at higher risk of motor vehicle accident, uh, work-related accidents and suicide uh, as a population as a whole, and they have a high rate of back pain. So the group that I see are often highly dis um, high opioid using people with chronic back pain, but they remain active. And my perspective is they're less disabled in that they're doing stuff, they're taking tablets and they're doing stuff because they're country men. Uh, the second thing is about the model of care, and this is, comes from the um, National Pain Strategy document, but also the New South Wales group, and they talk about really building up community care, including you know, pharmacists and population health, so some self-efficacy work, some education work, uh, primary health care networks uh, with pharmacy input prior to sort of sending up to specialist care and tertiary care in multidisciplinary uh, pain centres such as where I would work. And this is a problem in community regional health is because the, the, both the population health is lower, so uh, self-efficacy and health literacy. Generally, the primary health care is in patches excellent, but in other areas can be quite deficient, particularly in remote, remote areas. And then access to these services are very limited, hence the role for telehealth. So Ballarat has 250,000 people. Um, we set up a small pain clinic and essentially we were then inundated. Ballarat Pain Clinic now has a four year wait list. And essentially when you look at some of the other things and the population, we should be dealing with five to 600 patients a year if we were to match the city services, the population and activity. But instead, we're seeing about 100 new with 1.1 uh, medical specialist. So one day a fortnight. Just far, not, not enough for the population. So they are underserviced from population, but this is all we can get out of Ballarat Health Services. There is a pain program and allied health input, and so they need a new model of care to direct it to that so that the medical person just sees uh, those that are you know, needed to be seen or to be managed. And there's a big push for opioid permits because to me, there's a lot of opioid prescribed patients out in rural areas that need permits and higher doses. Uh, they did a pilot with the Victorian uh, Persistent Pain Outcome Collaboration. We did a trial of uh, Royal Melbourne, uh, Caulfield and um, Ballarat. We had great difficulty recruiting patients, great difficulty getting the systems right, and but we did not show that there was a deficiency. They still got benefit when they used these questionnaire studies from the service. So the patients aren't resistant to change. It's actually the health systems are resistant to implementing the services that are required. Uh, there are a number of funding models, Rural Health Outreach Fund. I'm going to go past this. This is the regional map from the government. So very remote is RA5, remote is RA4 and then RA3. And that is implied in the telehealth program. So the telehealth came in, MBS uh, funded. And there was an onboard incentive, which is now gone. And basically you get your normal item number plus 50%. So I do a pain consult, I get $128 when I uh, is added on to about 100 and, um, 200 bucks or something, and then you get 75 or 85% of that. So for us, running it in a public pain clinic, 
it was really difficult. And we were averaging 650 bucks income, which wasn't covering our costs. So my hospital's now gone, mm, we don't like a Medicare clinics in a public hospital because we can't cover our costs. And so business cases to, to run a Medicare clinic has fallen away. And same thing if you're going to do bulk billing in rural areas via, as a specialist, it's, it's not sustainable, even with a 50% uh, you know, uh, encouragement. There has been some statewide incentives and recently we've done one with uh, Health Direct and so we're using a Health Direct uh, platform which I'll talk about shortly. But pain medicine and I think drug and alcohol to some extent is, is really suitable, as is psychiatry, it's really suitable for telehealth because you don't have to really examine the patient. You need to talk to them and you need to educate them and you need to engage the GP and the local providers. So when we do run a telehealth clinic, we do it with either a GP or a nurse practitioner in the region. Uh, and that works well, but it works better as a paid session or funded through a state system than it is through a Medicare system. And this is an MBS assessment, and there's mostly been, uh, telehealth's mostly been taken up by physicians. Very little has been taken up by power care and pain medicine. Uh, and anesthesia is another thing, pre-admission clinics or big hospitals are now starting to do telehealth. So the, the wrong groups are using telehealth than what we, we need. So I'm going to go through. Health Direct is the one that's won out. It's a, it's a federally government supported module, uh, thing. It's, it's now um, encrypted. It's fantastic. Most of it we have still used Skype, which has, uh, has some federal government approval to use, but it's not encrypted, so it's not very secure. But most GPs want to use Skype. We are transitioning them all onto Health Direct. Um, so what's the access for rural areas? When we did this study on waiting in pain, 0.05% versus 0.17% for outer urban and rural areas. So access to pain services is, is a, essentially a third of what it is in the city. And so therefore we need to use the GPs to a greater extent. And there's also this concern about prescribing. And when I wrote this slide, I hadn't this hadn't come through. So this is the Atlas, which came out in 2015, looking at variation in healthcare. And this is number of opioid scripts per capita, okay? And so there's a 10 times variability. If you lived in Bandura, Bunda, Bundara Council, versus if you lived in Eden Hope, okay? So you got out of Western Victoria, 10 times the prescribing of opioids compared to Hawthorne. And not only that, is that there's a variability based on socioeconomics. So on the right-hand side here, you've got very remote areas, which is actually low. So Arnhem Land is low, because you've just got no doctors in Arnhem Land. Um, so there's no opioid scripts per capita. But in rural areas, if you're in low socioeconomic, your variability um, was higher. Your, your ability to get an opioid script was higher. And this is shown in American studies as well. There's a link between socioeconomics and uh, distress levels and opioids. Um, and it's, it's at a higher opioid, uh, higher socioeconomics, you have less opioid prescribing. Um, and then this is major cities. So high socioeconomic group in the major cities is here. And so your prescribing is around the 25,000 scripts per 100,000 population versus uh, low socioeconomic in rural areas, you're up here. Okay. So the, to me, these are the two big factors. And then when you look at the rural areas, I believe there's this socioeconomic drift out of Melbourne. Along the train lines, the hamlets around Ballarat, Bendigo, uh, out to Horsham, down to Geelong to Warrnambool, that's where people who are on high-dose opiates, on disability pension, they might be burned out addicts, they might be chronic pain patients, they can't afford to live in Melbourne. They find a caravan out in the little areas. And so that in part explains higher prescribing in the rural areas, but the other part is, I believe, explained by low access to services, low, you know, low access to allied health input. Now, we're also being compared to America. And this is, a lot of this concern has been driven by America. And I'm not sure, I worked in America medically and it's a different healthcare system. It's a different culture. And so if you look at the prescribing and the opioid dosing versus, uh, and the deaths, it's really three times Australia when you look at it per capita, okay? 
But the same thing is with car accidents. They're about double per capita, the deaths, because they don't have to wear seatbelts. They can drive whatever speed they want. They're, they're idiots on the road. So they've got a higher death rate. But they have a higher problem with opioids and they have a higher amount related to um, uh, non-medical prescription, so 50% misuse. So they've got a different misuse group and cohort. I just make that point because it's possible that the rural population is different to the city population based on this sort of socioeconomics and access. And they tell me that heroin is very hard to get in the rural areas. It sort of comes from the, on the boats and so it spreads out from Port Melbourne. So the access to heroin is in a circle from Port Melbourne, well, conceptually. So, yeah. So in rural areas, it's prescription misuse. Yeah. Uh, this is this is nationally. Wait time is not as bad as everyone says it is. Fifty five days. But I think the wait time for rural areas is more difficult, and that's where the concept of linking into city service can be really important. People still respond with allied health programs. I'm going to move past this, and then cannabis to me is the other concern. I think there's a cannabis market out in the rural areas. Good. Any other comments or questions? I do actually have a colleague who's rural doctor. Is there any other rural medical people here? Great. So I'd love your insight or your commentary based on that. Do you have any comments specifically? No, I think what you said uh, is right. Um, it's cheap to live, uh, particularly Queenstown and Tasmania, mining community, uh, very cheap accommodation. And we had a very high incidence of uh, uh, prescription Oxycontin uses. Hillbilly heroin users down there. Fiona's from Dalsley area. Any comments, Fiona? Yeah, I'd say the same thing. Um, you know, areas of the state that um, might seem very appealing for a, a cosy weekend, but actually when you live there, there's, um, there's a sort of um, quite an enormous underclass of underprivileged people who often have lots of mental health issues, um, yeah, lots of dual diagnosis stuff. Um, and then it might not even be like accessing the pain clinic in Melbourne, it's actually getting them there as well. Um, like the logistics of, of getting someone who's in pain to travel that distance. Yep. And it's expensive. It's expensive, they're in pain. Um, yeah, so. And just the continuity of care stuff is the I think what you've said also parallels the codeine story. Because you look at places like, and I haven't got any figures for this, but when I travelled around the state, um, how did I get my throat cut to saying this, but Bensdale, Shepparton, Mildura, very heavy Europe users of ibuprofen codeine. Your outer suburbs of Melbourne, similar, but, and, and your CBD is very heavy, but the ordinary suburbs, and I won't mention any names, the usage seems to be much lower. So it would tend to parallel what you've said about uh, the prescribed, the uh, sheet of eight opioids. Mm. Yeah. So the three main areas are La Trobe area, the south, the, the western Victoria, and there's a, that pocket that extends up into Mujura. So that that mm. that little border there between New South Wales and South Australia and Victoria is is, is a high opioid use area. And we had a um, trading forum in Warrnambool last week, and the comment that came up over and over and over again was the lack of availability of a pain service to refer patients to yeah. So conceptually, what we argue with the government is that Geelong has a tertiary service that should capture that area. I, as a Mel, uh, Royal Melbourne, we try to do telehealth into that region. I think St Vincent's should do that region. I think Caulfield should do that region. We want the government to say that model's good. You've got a tertiary, a secondary, and a, and a community thing. And we're going to fund you to provide liaison works and a telephone link up, early triage for people in your section. So if I get a referral from La Trobe, I send it to, to Caulfield. And I think that's giving or empowering both the community areas to say, I want to link with the tertiary service and that they're funded to support me. But at the moment, we're not funded very well. We've got, we're, we're taking in locals in, in generally in preference, although I'm doing a few telehealth links to specific areas. Does that make sense? It's what we're looking for at, a, at an advocacy perspective. We haven't quite got a statewide pain plan yet, but I think we'll get one out of this issue. Won't we, John? 
We hope, yeah. I mean, it's quite, as I said at the very beginning, uh, this the whole codeine thing is certainly, I guess it's done two things. It's raised the profile of uh, uh, pain management and pain management services and challenges writ large. It's also raised a number of issues, and I can't say too much at the moment, but we are closely looking at some bigger issues related to S8 opioids. I mean, while some of the patterns are different between us and the US, we certainly sit in between the US and Europe, for example, in whether you look at any of the statistics on deaths, on, on usage and so forth. And uh, sadly, we often follow the US a few years behind. So it's, it's really right, put the spotlight on those two issues as well as coding proper.